Nate Books Podcast. I am your host and author, Mr. Nate. Today, we get to cover the brand new children's book, A Mouse in the House on Easter Day, the resurrection rhyme of the greatest Sunday. Now, this is the 13th uh, children's book in the series, Life and Behavior. And this also is attached to uh, other books in the series that are holiday books. There's a Halloween, which is not necessarily a holiday in my opinion, but Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and now Easter. And there's going to be more to come out of this. There's also the other series, the Elijah's Journey series, and I have some fun new updates coming with that uh, later on. But nonetheless, today we're, we're going over the new Easter book. And what a fun way to provide a biblical truth to a culture that often does not know about Easter. They just know Easter. And you might have come across this podcast and maybe you, you're not part of a church or you've never been to church or your kids have not been to church. And what you know of Easter is bunnies and eggs and marketing from big box stores and uh, egg hunts and pastel colors and a bunch of candy <laughs> and eating peeps and <laughs> just doing whatever you're going to do on that Sunday. Often in the last several decades of the United States history, Easter was a traditional holiday time that was more so known for the resurrection of Jesus. That there was Palm Sunday, so that, that's, how, that's what we know in the Bible, of the Sunday previous to uh, the Resurrection Sunday. So that means when you read the Bible's Gospels, there's a time frame when Jesus is entering the city of Jerusalem and within that week time frame, as he enters in and people are throwing down these palm branches and, you know, celebrating him within a week time frame, they're yelling crucify and he's going to be crucified on a Friday. And then he resurrects from the dead on Sunday. And that's historical truth. That's biblical truth. That's spiritual truth. And that's God's ultimate revelation, him revealing himself to the world especially Jesus uh, revealing that he is God in the flesh, God the Son, the Son of God, the Son of Man. So this Easter book is for you, those that are not part of a church. This Easter book is for those that are part of a church. That this is a book to introduce you to the gospel, introduce you to the importance of this Sunday in history, introduce you to the importance of the Bible, the importance of our life and God, and providing a fun way, a fun tool, a fun teaching tool, a fun activity uh, with our kids. And you could be a grandparent, you could be a parent, you could be a single mom, single dad, you could be a pastor, you could be a children's ministry worker, volunteer, teacher, right? You could be coming from any direction. This book is going to be in your hands to read in front of kids, and you're going to have a moment. It could be about uh, 10 minutes worth of reading and then a little question and answer at the end of this book. And you're going to have options to pause or read the whole thing and ask questions at the end to really dig into the deeper things of the Bible, of history, so that these kids understand who Jesus is. But this book is really to, to uh, intercept, to connect, to engage with our culture that, hey, Easter, it might not be all about eggs and candy. <laughs> is eggs and candy wrong? No, not necessarily, right? But often what Easter is to kids is just that. It's not church. It's not the Bible. It's not Jesus. It's not all these things. And so often in history, there's also the old adage that we're to be quiet as a church mouse. And the idea is be very quiet. That means you cannot be heard. You don't want to make um, noise. That's often said to uh, kids, you know, in the traditional churches throughout the decades. But often that idea is what our culture is kind of screaming at uh, the Christian world. 
to basically be quiet in our culture about the gospel, about the Bible. There's different ways that's happening. And the interesting uh, idea throughout history and the Bible is God does not want that. He is the loudest one. (laughs) He is the one that makes himself known. And a different way to say that is he has revealed himself. He's revealed himself in his creation. He's revealed himself through his written word. He's revealed himself through the living word, Jesus Christ. There's, there's his purposes in life, and then there's ours. And ours is supposed to change to what he wants. And what he wants is for us to know who this Jesus is. That's the most important thing about this world. It's not us. It's not something else. It's him. So what this children's book does it brings fun, it, it brings memorable lines, it brings activity and interaction so that kids can be taught something about this time frame and not lose what we have lost in this recent American history and this history in the world. And what an opportunity we have right now to not be quiet, to not be a mouse uh, in the house that is quiet like a church mouse, but that we're someone who understands when we come to know the gospel, we get to now do with it what God wants. And that's part of this book. So if you are somebody from the church, you might know certain words like missional. This is a missional book. This is a evangelistic book. This is a book that captures the gospel and what to do with it and what to do with it in our lives, that we're to do something with it. And so nonetheless, this book opens up with a concept of a mouse, right? A mouse in the house on on this particular day. But this mouse is going to be compared to elephants, right? You have the scene of elephants are often scared of the small mice. But the general biblical truth that I'm trying to capture as an author is the bigness or the oldness of these elephants that these kids will learn about is the concept that in the New Testament Gospels, it's the pride that Jesus talks about that will want to reject him. But if we are like children, like a childlike faith, that we would have a trust in him or a humility that we understand we are small and he is the biggest and he is the most glorious, that we then will understand what it's all about, what he is all about, what the gospel is, and entrust our life. And so you have this idea between pride and humility, right? It's a childlike faith. So this opens up now in the first pages. A mouse in the house is screamed aloud, an unwanted, pesky rodent that scares a crowd. Not today, nor any other day. Why must I deal with it even on Sunday? And our culture often is saying, hey, I don't want to deal with this God thing. I don't want to deal with this church thing. Why do I need to attend a church or be a member or be involved with or learn the Bible? It is dismissing. We're starting to use uh, or reuse old uh, arguments that this world is only material. Uh, There's a lot of atheistic things happening uh, again, even though people today think atheist is a word that's, that is uh, against God or against all gods. But historically in the Roman Empire, 2,000 years ago, during Jesus' time frame, an atheist was actually a Christian, or at least the most general form is theistic. Somebody who believed in one God, and they were against the other gods. So our culture today is just reusing and recycling a lot of things from the past, and we're rejecting these things, and now our families and traditions and our culture are being reformed to do whatever we are wanting to do instead of what God wants us to do. And so we are acting like that elephant, and we are saying, no, get this pesky thing away But a house to house it goes, appearing where nobody knows. The little one's tender care invites the mouse without a scare. That there is a tenderness among the neighborhood of of the world. That the church, 
the Christian church are to be a hospitable, welcoming people because of what we proclaim, believe, hold fast to. And the next page captures that. The older rids it with their fear, defending their house with great terror. House to house it goes, appearing where nobody knows. Where is this mouse? How, How can we squash it? Down the street with open doors, large is the mansion with so many floors. Enter the hole into the unknown, come to learn of one great throne. Now this is capturing a kind of a multifaceted or dimension, if you will. That The mouse is going to go into this uh, metaphorical situation, this church service. But it's also capturing the idea that the Christian church are believers in Jesus, and he is the representation of heaven. The more you get to know the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you start to understand that if you want to get to know heaven, you need to get to know Jesus. If you want to get to know who God the Father is, you need to learn Jesus, and vice versa. Everything is wrapped up in who he is, and this is the plan of God through the Old and New Testament of the Bible. But nonetheless, when we would walk into a church building, we are to understand or at least taste what then heaven is like, more so who God is, because heaven is the home or the abode of God. And how great. So what happens through the rest of this book and the rhyme is this mouse is in the service and has a heavenly taste, if you will. But nonetheless, learning what the church service is teaching and proclaiming. And it continues to go on a different home without fright. Learn of the king who rules upright, Jesus. (laughs) He welcomes in those large and small to receive what he has done for us all. And the idea from here is that it's going to transition to describe and teach Jesus in different ways. It's going to pick up Old Testament truths. There's a part in here where it's it's going to mention um, the ark. It's Noah's ark that in the Bible's Old Testament, most people generally know about Noah's ark. But nonetheless, there's a sense that that gets carried over into the New Testament as not a literal thing that then now happens, Uh, as it did literally happen. I do believe it literally happened. But it's the idea of condemnation and judgment. And that when Jesus comes, he's taking upon that condemnation, that judgment. And he's going to provide salvation. And he is the ark, if you will. He is the Savior, and he's welcoming all those in. But nonetheless, there's going to be one day in the future that the ark will be closed, that proverbial metaphorical ark, if you will, will be closed. There will be a time in history, in our case, time in the future, that will be a marker. And in the Bible, that's the day of the Lord, the end times. There's different ways you can capture or teach that. But nonetheless, Jesus is the most important to uh, understand here. And it's going to, the rhyme continues to go on. Uh, Undisturbed, they learn of the great king's return. A different time and a different place. He once visited the human race. So before the end times, he actually did come. Planned and fulfilled, he came to be killed. And it captures so much of the Old Testament prophecies and these truths. And what I think is so helpful in Christianity and in the Bible, in God's ultimate world, his revelation that He has provided all that is necessary for us to know that he is truthful, that the gospel is truthful, truthful, that the resurrection is truthful. I like to call it trackable and traceable truth. That when you go through the Old Testament, you go through history, and you go through different elements like archaeology, you start to uncover or discover or rediscover these truths that he was supposed to be born in a specific time, people, place, and he he's going to be Jewish. He's going to be an Israelite. He's going to be among this family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's what the Old Testament says. 
So when you fast forward thousands of years from that prophecy, or there's multiple prophecies happening from the book of Genesis on, you start to see that when Jesus does come, you now can link these traceable, trackable truths to this specific one who's born through Mary in Bethlehem, grows up in Nazareth, and is continuing to fulfill all these traceable and trackable truths. So that when he does die, when he is crucified, like Isaiah chapter 52 through 53 say in the Old Testament, and when he resurrects from the dead and he fulfills all that is necessary for God's righteous salvation of us, that we can trust that. We can trust that it's true. We can remind and teach children, the next generation. And we could be people who are sinners, that when we grab this book or just the Bible itself, and we understand we have lived a wrecked life, or or we've, we have lived a so-called moral life, like the Jews of the New Testament, but we have rejected God, we have this moment to repent, to change. And we can now provide our kids, our grandkids, our neighborhood, an opportunity of change. That's what God wants until one day that ark will close, right? And there's this line in here, the path seems dark, but only to those outside the ark. And so if we're people that want to reject, if we're prideful, if we're going to be elephants that are swollen in pride, and we're going to use our age that we've lived on this earth, and we're uh, experienced, and we know that God does not exist, we will live in that darkness, and we will be condemned. And we will be separated from him forever. And nonetheless, Jesus walks that path of darkness to the cross. And that's what um, this book is capturing. And then it's going to get to the point where it says, Stretched on the cross to breathe his last. He speaks, it is finished as he passed. Down he goes, one without a fight, into the tomb to be brought back to life. And that's capturing that idea that he was silent as a lamb to the slaughter. It's an Old Testament passage. And nonetheless, you get to the last pages, and it's going to talk about the good news of the risen one for the world to know, spread from house to house since long ago. House to house it goes, appearing where nobody knows. And that was the purpose of the gospel, that it would go forth as a mission. It's missional, God's mission on the earth to make it known, the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. And for those that don't know of it, he wants them to know of it. And so there's a juxtaposition that's happening. There's a transfer of idea that's happening. We go from the beginning of the book and the rhyme, all about a mouse, and now we're talking about the gospel and how it's going forth into the world and how we participate in it. And The reason why the Christian church often has gathered on mainly Sundays is because of Jesus resurrecting on Sunday. But then there's one particular Sunday that he is uh, the resurrected one, that he has come back to life. And then it gets to one of the last pages. To the world known as Easter Sunday, they may scream of an awful day, but to the small, resurrection marks our call. We are not known as uh, Easter people, meaning there there is background to the word Easter, right? There are uh, non-Christian background to it, and then there's Christian and even Catholic background to the word Easter. But nonetheless, our culture today often doesn't know any of that, okay? (laughs) You can try to Wikipedia, you can try to look it up in dictionaries, you can try to look it up in encyclopedias, there's commentaries and resources and primary sources, but nonetheless, this time in history, there is a day and time to where resurrection of Jesus Christ confirms, validates, and affirms who he was, who he is, and who he is to be forever. He's God in flesh. He's Emmanuel, God with us. And we then are people of the cross. We're people of the tomb. We are people of Christ, that we follow him. And resurrection marks our call. And now, on the the last page, house to house it goes, appearing where nobody knows. Crowds may scream, crucify. But we hear him, 
and testify. No matter what one may fear or say, join us in trusting him, the resurrected one, on Sunday. And the purpose of that last part is to engage kids. It's it's to engage readers, even older readers, right? If you're a grandparent, 70, 60, um, if you're a parent, if you're a pastor or a teacher, you're, you're, you want to engage your readers to belief and to action, right? So if we believe in him, then there's going to be a life of repentance. And that start of repentance is when we trust in him. And he's called us to that. He's making himself known house to house. And now we participate in that. And so this is my opportunity as a Christian pastor to then make that available as a helpful Christian um, a resource, a children's book for the marketplace, not merely for a church. This is meant to go forth into our culture and to be of a help in so many different ways. Then there's reading questions at the end. I hope you guys get a chance to, and we'll upload the uh, answers to those here soon, along with the other children's books. And I'm looking forward to update you on uh, the coming books. Uh, there's a more children's books uh, in the independent series, Life and Behavior, and then the Elijah's Journey uh, children's books. They're also having another addition to that. We're going to do chapter books. So you will have the choice between a reading book, a chapter book, or a fully illustrated book. And with the chapter books, those are going to come out faster than the illustrated books. So we will be able to complete the whole entire 68 book series of the Elijah's journey uh, faster than we could have when starting out with a fully illustrated book. So I'm really excited about that. We've been been working on that this past year, and uh, it's really going to help us this year. So uh, if you have uh, any needs, any uh, questions, do let me know. And I'm glad that you've tuned in today. I look forward to being with you again on the next episode. And thank you again. And this is Mr. Nate. I'm out.